Tools kill creativity. Yes. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's a thought-provoking idea. <laughs> well, that was uh, the title of a talk by Sir Ken Robinson, and probably the most popular TED Talk that TED has had uh, during its history. And the, what, te what he talked about was the fact that sort of the industrial school system we have today doesn't serve the creative arts very well. And uh, we will need these creative arts in the future. So I enjoyed his talk, I really enjoyed his humor, very entertaining talk, but what was interesting is he really didn't offer a solution. Now, years later, I was really looking for a solution because my own kids were going into high school and this all became very personal and emotional for me. So I saw my kids going to the normal system and really my gut started hurting because I, as I saw how they operated, the schools operated, they just didn't seem to work very well. You know, the teachers were nice and competent, but the whole thing just didn't seem to work very well. And it reminded me a lot of the things that I see in my day job. So now I guess I need to talk to you about my day job. So I'm a strategist. I, I look at, I help companies large and small with their strategy and, and uh, uh, operations. And I guess what I want to do today is tell you about my two-year journey about using the skills for my day job and looking at the educational system. Now, you know, all of us w probably went through the educational system, but at that point, we're the rat in the maze, right? We don't go there, yes, sir, you know, and so on. But it's interesting to look at it from the outside with a scientific view. So here's how I want to do it. First, I want to make some high-level observations. Second, I want to talk about the fundamental economic underpinnings of the education system. I know that's not something we talk about very much, but I want to talk about that because I think that really will go a long way in explaining why it behaves the way it does. Third, I want to talk about why it's so hard to change. Okay? And fourth, on a positive note, after these two years, I want to let you know that I'm actually quite positive about the prospect for change for the educational system, that is, I think we can get to low cost, high quality, lifelong education if we can all do just a couple of things. So hold that thought. So observations. Yeah. You know, when you first look at the system, the first observation you make is, we take kids, and we segregate them from society and we put them into this thing called the education system. They can't leave, it's a prison, right? <laughs> and after about 11 years or so, we say, so what do you wanna do in life? I mean, you know, I don't think that's a particularly fair question to ask. How would they know? Another observation. The education system is amazingly insular. Uh, the people that work in it, the professors, the administrators, the teachers, have likely worked with it their whole careers. The interesting thing about that is, we as a society look at the education system as the key thing that produces workers and citizens for the rest of society. Again, this doesn't seem to jive, right? There's almost no interaction going on. Third, you know, most of us, after K through 12 education, we hope our kids go to fabulous colleges. And in order to uh, facilitate this process, there's all sorts of uh, college prep programs. There's AP, there's uh, IB, and um, ACE, and so on. Now, what's interesting is they're all pretty self-similar, you know? Four years of English, three years of math, two years of foreign language, and so on. But what's the first question that really great colleges ask. So how are you different? Now again, I don't think that's particularly fair. You know, we load down the kids with this largely self-similar self program, and then sort of say, hey, you know, uh, how can I build true differentiation? So then what are we left with? We're left with standardized tests, on the one hand, and grades. Now I want to talk about grades. What are they for? <laughs> just a just basic question, what are they for? 
I mean, certainly there's some certification. You know, if you get an AL algebra, we think you know algebra. But what I'm really interested in is, what if you get a D in algebra? What does that mean? Well, it certainly means you don't know algebra. I think that's pretty clear, but why? Well, maybe you're not a good student. Maybe you didn't have a good teacher. You know, it may be that you were just in a, not in a life condition where, you know, algebra was important to you. <laughs> I guess my point is this D in algebra really doesn't have an economic benefit. And that's kind of funny if you think about it because this is one of the few circumstances where we pay for an economic good that can actually filter us out of our own future. So we have a funny system, right? I mean, you just, let's just admit it. Now, Whenever you, whenever you as a strategist look at something like this, you have to ask, well, why is it the way it is? After all, things that have been running for hundreds of years don't end up that way for no reason. So I think the key insight to understanding the educational system is to understand its economic underpinnings. And by the way, this is true whether you're talking about K-12 education, you're talking about college education, uh, even graduate education to a certain degree. And here's the key thing. The whole education system is based on the following. There's a scarce resource, which we call the teacher. There's a scarce resource, which we call the classroom. And the education system takes these two things together and through a craftsman-like model delivers education to banks of kids as they go by, okay? So those are the three fundamentals. It's craftsman model, scarcity of the two aspects of education. Now, you know, it's, as long as the scarcity is real, one could argue, eh, maybe it's not a bad system, right? But what's interesting to me is, you know, let's consider the craftsman model. Nearly every industry starts out as a craftsman model. But you know what happens rapidly afterwards? People start looking at the basic processes that occur and say, well, how can we optimize these in such a way that the quality of delivery is consistent the cost goes down, and maybe there's different service levels. Well, I mean, we know this. I mean, if the food industry has, you can have McDonald's, Panera, et cetera. If the, the hotel industry has this. But education, uniquely, we're still in the craftsman model. And, you know, and the consequences are huge in terms of waste. I mean, just think about it. How old is algebra? Hundreds of years old? But thousands of teacher today, teachers today across the United States will get up Develop a lecture, deliver the lecture. Do assessment, correct the assessments, and then get on the hamster wheel to do it over and over again. Now, every other industry would look at that and say, you know, let's optimize the heck out of this and let's take the most core resource we have, the teacher and the one-on-one -on -one time, that's the most valuable thing that's there, maximize that and automate the rest of this stuff. It can be done, let me tell you. Let's talk about these other two scarcities that drive the whole economics of the system. So one is the classroom. Well, we all know with computer technology and the internet, we can have virtual classrooms. And they're advantageous in many, many ways. But one key way they're advantageous, advantageous is it's eminently scalable. I mean, we're currently building physical buildings all over the place. Enormous amounts of money are being spent on physical buildings as if buildings could teach, you know? Let's talk about the teacher. I've talked about the productivity of the teacher, but realistically, with, tech, uh, with the internet technology, um, one can actually source a much wider variety of teachers and quality of teachers geographically. So if you want to get an industrial arts teacher living in Michigan to teach something in Florida, you can. If you want to get a, you know, a Chinese-speaking teacher from San Francisco to teach in Michigan, you can. We just have to think broadly. So what does this all net out to? If we just, in education, did the things every other industry does, focus on process optimization, focus on using technology and innovation, and do that as a forward-looking process, I think we can fundamentally change uh, how education works. So that leads to the question, so why hasn't it already happened? Right? Obviously, these are large bureaucracies, <laughs> I mean, and they don't want to change, right? 
By the way, that's true for every bureaucracy, not just education. And I think one could say uh, there's like kind of this local versus global decision making that happens a lot. I mean, take that algebra teacher. If you've been teaching algebra for nine years, teaching it the same way the 10th year really isn't that, that much incremental effort. But teaching it a completely different way with higher productivity, well, that's a lot of work. So there's a lot of inertia in the system. Also, the, what, what I'm talking about here is pretty different day to day. So it's kind of like you know, Sears trying to try, figure out e-commerce. It's hard for them. Okay? But you know, all of that stuff I just said, it's true in other industries. So what, what's really different here? Well, what's really different here, I think, is we tolerate it. Let me give you an example. I know of IB programs where different teachers use different software programs. And because they use different software programs, there are students that are managing 20, 22, 25 different logins. Now, I don't think managing logins is a huge educational benefit. But my point is, just notice what just happened here. All the aggregate complexity for that education got pushed from the individual teachers to the student and their parents. We would not tolerate this in any other aspect of our life. I mean, if you went to a bank and every single teller told you there was a different way to interact to them, you wouldn't tolerate it. So what's different about education is we tolerate it. That's one thing. The second thing that's different is we have this kind of social, psychological straitjacket around education. That is, if you want to do something unconventional, it's kind of a social stigma tied to it. It's different. Oh, you didn't get quite the degree that we thought you should have gotten, or you didn't do it the way we wanted, right? And that itself creates inertia on in the whole system, because there's only one way to do things. I'm here to tell you there's actually a lot of exciting stuff happening. I mean, if you look around in the unconventional world, you have uh, folks like Western Governors University or uh, the University of Arizona offering uh, self-paced, uh, competency-based education at reasonable cost. Um, you have Florida Virtual School doing the same thing for K through 12 education. You know, just to realize what that means is the student can move at their own pace. They have 24-7 access to the materials. They can have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the, with the teacher. And they, we do this today, right? It's available to all, all of you. You have folks like Khan Academy, which are bypassing their accreditation functions and talking directly to, uh, to the employers and building a scale system for building those skills. And you know the educational system is paying attention when Purdue University, a large public university, buys Kaplan Learning Systems, okay? So if you add it all up, there's very interesting things happening in this unconventional world. Now you might ask, well, if you think this is all so great, what did you do with your kids? And indeed, what I'm here to tell you is, when I looked at this whole space, I had a left brain, right brain fight. <laughs> and the left brain said, you know, the analysis part said, I, I, I'm looking at this, and this is obvious. This is actually the best education at independent of cost you can get. But my right brain said, ah, it's different. What will others say? Right. But after two years, you know, the subjects of my scientific experiment, <laughs> my kids, <laughs> you know, are, 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 I can tell you that they're thriving. Now, I'm not saying everybody should do what I did. In fact, kind of my point is, you should all do what's right for you. But what I'm saying is, whoever your institutions of education are, you really need to demand from them innovative techniques and, and, and innovation in terms of what they do day to day. And when they don't provide it, be very open to the unconventional methods because the system won't change until you do, okay? And the second thing is, let's all collectively get rid of this social stigma around, around doing different ways of education. 
So, sort of finally, um, I think if we do all of this sort of stuff, um, there's an opportunity to really change the education system. And I think we can get to a point where the big part of education we don't talk about, which is adults, you know, as well as kids and college kids, all of us, I think, should have an ability to get access to education literally as a utility. And I think we can get there, okay? I thought this was an interesting idea and that's why I wanted to share it with you. Thank you. <laughs>